The Prime Minister remains defiant, saying he'll get on with his job, despite a steady stream of ministerial resignations. Boris Johnson tells a packed and rowdy Prime Minister's questions that he's not walking away, despite the resignation of two senior members of the Cabinet and 16 junior government and party figures. The job of a Prime Minister in difficult circumstances when he's been handed a colossal mandate is to keep going, and that's what I'm going to do. Labour's Sir Keir Starmer said the Prime Minister was in the dying act of his career. Anyone quitting now after defending all that hasn't got a shred of integrity. Yeah. Mr Speaker, isn't this the first recorded case of the sinking ships fleeing the rat? Well, this lunchtime, more Conservative MPs are signalling their unhappiness about the Prime Minister's leadership. We'll be finding out what voters think. I think lie after lie after lie. Um, yeah, he's lost the confidence, so he's, he's got to go, unfortunately. I'd like to see Boris carry on. I think he's done a pretty decent job. I know he's had a bit of problems. Nadim Zahawi arrives at the Treasury, replacing Rishi Sunak as Chancellor. With inflation at a 40-year high, we'll assess the challenges in his entry. I'll bring you all the very latest from here in Westminster. Our other stories on today's programme. Dozens of arrests are made in an international police operation targeting a people smuggling gang thought to have brought 10,000 migrants across the channel. It's kickoff tonight for the Women's European Football Championship. England is the host and among the favourites to win. And here at Wimbledon, two British doubles players try to follow up Cameron Norrie's success last night and the quarterfinals continue. Coming up on the BBC News Channel, triathlon is the first British sport to establish a new open category allowing transgender athletes to compete. Hello, a very good afternoon. Welcome to the BBC's News at One from Downing Street. Boris Johnson says he is keeping on with the job despite a wave of government resignations. We have seen a growing number of ministers and aides resign over the course of the morning. Their numbers stand at 18 at the latest count, with many expressing unhappiness at the Prime Minister's style of leadership and expressing concerns that the government work is being overshadowed by questions about his integrity. But Boris Johnson, at Prime Minister's questions in the last hour, insisted he will keep working with his new team in place after Rishi Sunak quit last night as Chancellor and Sajid Javid as Health Secretary. Well, just in the last few minutes, Mr Javid has told the Commons that the public expects all politicians to maintain honesty and integrity in whatever we do. Our first report is from our political correspondent, Jonathan Blake. Holding on, fighting on, for now. Boris Johnson left Downing Street this morning with his leadership hanging in the balance. Even as he made his way to Parliament to face a grilling in the Commons, more ministers and Conservative MPs were saying publicly his time was up. This morning, Mr Speaker, I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. <laughs> The Prime Minister managing a laugh at his own expense as the number of government vacancies grew. The tone changed as Sir Keir Starmer challenged Boris Johnson's appointment of Chris Pincher as Deputy Chief Whip. He knew the accused minister had previously committed predatory behaviour, but he promoted him to a position of power anyway. Why? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, that individual, the uh, member for Tamworth, no longer has the Conservative whip. He no longer has a, a job. He, he is no longer, as soon as I was aware, made aware of the, the allegation that he has just read out, uh, Mr Speaker, and the complaint that was made, uh, he, lost, uh, his, um, he lost his status as a Conservative MP. And he is the Labour leader accused the Prime Minister of turning a blind eye to misconduct time and again. It was the same when his ally 
was on the tape from the lobbyists. Yeah. Yeah. It was the same when his Home Secretary was bullying staff. It was the same when taxpayers' money was being abused, yeah. and it was the same when he and his mates parted their way through lockdown. He talks about in integrity. Uh, he, wanted, uh, he wanted to install uh, the member for Islington North into number 10, uh, Mr Speaker. That's what, that's what he wanted to do. Imagine, imagine what our country and what the world would be like now. Barely any support came from Boris Johnson's own side. Instead, more stinging questions from Conservative backbenchers. Does the Prime Minister think there are any circumstances in which he should resign? <laughs> As the Prime Minister constantly tries to deflect from the issue, always tries to blame other people for mistakes, and that at least nothing um, left for him to do other than to take responsibility and resign. Today I ask him to do the honourable thing, to put the interests of the nation before his own interests and before, in, in, in his own words, it does become impossible for government to do its job. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Things were bad enough for Boris Johnson yesterday morning. Glum faces around the Cabinet table as questions continued about his judgment. But within hours, two of his most senior ministers had resigned. Rishi Sunak quit as Chancellor, saying standards of government were worth fighting for, and he and the Prime Minister had fundamental differences. And Sajid Javid, the now former Health Secretary, said Boris Johnson's government was neither competent nor popular. Some are still supporting the Prime Minister. Nadeem Zahawi, until yesterday Education Secretary, rewarded for his loyalty with a promotion to Chancellor. Are you confident this government will last, you Mr Zahawi? He's right to say, look, I made a mistake. Um, I'm sorry for that. And I, you know, take collective responsibility. I'm sorry that um, we made that mistake. But, you know, as I say, we make decisions at warp speed and we don't always get them right. The way I would sum up the Prime Minister's focus for you is in three words, delivery, delivery, delivery. It's no surprise Boris Johnson is holding on. He argues he has a mandate and a majority. His critics are finding out that it's hard to get rid of a Prime Minister who doesn't want to go. But even for him, the pressure may yet become too much to bear. And I have been given a categorical assurance that the Prime Minister was not aware of... Two days ago, Children's Minister Will Quince defended Boris Johnson's appointment of Chris Pincher as Deputy Chief Whip, despite misconduct allegations, with a line that turned out to be untrue. He quit this morning and the resignations have kept coming. Justice Minister Victoria Adkins, one of several more junior government figures to go, saying we can and must be better than this. And backbenchers are going public too, with letters of no confidence and calls for Boris Johnson to go. Back in the Commons, a resignation statement from Sajid Javid summed up Conservatives' concerns. But treading the tightrope between loyalty and integrity has become impossible in recent months. And Mr Speaker, I will never risk losing my integrity. I also believe a team is as good as its team captain and that a captain is as good as his or her team. So loyalty must go both ways. The events of recent months have made it increasingly difficult to be in that team. Jonathan Blake, BBC fair. News. Well, let's cross to our political correspondent, Nick Erdley, who is over in the Commons. And Nick, it's been quite hard to keep up with everything this morning. And then when we look at some of those comments we're hearing in the Commons in the last hour, what an extraordinary day. It is, Jane, and it's just going from worse to worse to even worse for Boris Johnson. This morning we had that steady stream of resignations, ministers and their aides deciding that enough was enough. Then we had three MPs stand up and tell Boris Johnson to his face at Prime Minister's questions that enough was enough. And then the, health sec the former Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, using those exact words during that excruciating statement on why he'd decided to resign, saying enough is enough. Now, we've heard Boris Johnson say he wants to stay on. He's planning to try and tough this one out. He argues he has a personal mandate from the electorate from that general election in 19, 2019. But I've got to say, the mood in the Conservative Party has changed dramatically. And it feels to me like the party has now 
turned his back on the Prime Minister. Watching PMQs there, there were almost no cheers from the back benches. There was almost nobody apart from a few loyal cabinet ministers who were cheering the Prime Minister on. There are discussions ongoing as we speak about ways to force the, force the Prime Minister out. Potentially a confidence vote, another one in the next few days if the rules on that are changed. Boris Johnson has defied political gravity before. He has turned things around in the past. But standing here in Parliament this afternoon, speaking to Tory MPs, watching what's going on in the governing party at the moment is very hard to see that happening. An increasing number of Conservatives are concluding that it's game over. Nick, thank you for now. Nick Early will be back with Nick uh, later in the programme. Let's uh, see where we are by the time we return to him. Well, it is, of course, the first day in the new job for the new Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi. He enters the Treasury with inflation at a 40-year high and households facing energy bills hitting £3,000 a year in the coming months. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, is outside the Treasury. Uh, what uh, awaits him? What policy changes might we see, Faisal? Yes, Jane, it's one thing this sort of political uncertainty occurring full stop, but for it to occur against the backdrop of multiple overlapping economic crises around the world, economic crises that, as we have reported, could bring energy bills on average up above £3,000 a year if some internal industry estimates are to be believed. It's quite enough for those things to be happening at the same time. So the new Chancellor Nadim Zahawi is in this building at work and he's been dropping some hints in a morning round of interviews that there may be a difference in, a, in approach in terms of tax and spend policy. Remember Rishi Sunak in his resignation letter said not just he had concerns about uh, integrity but he also had concerns about policy that the Prime Minister and the now former Chancellor were not on the same page ahead of a key speech that they want to give on the cost of living crisis next week. Some suggestions from the new Chancellor that he was willing to review all economic decisions, some of the tax rise decisions for business, the extent perhaps and speed of tax cuts, uh, income tax cuts that were not due until 2024 uh, and perhaps even uh, an issue he's been lobbied over but given this cost of living crisis, the idea of a VAT cut too. Uh, all issues that they say that they'll look at. Uh, also, they're going to look at some spending decisions too. Key issue, uh, public sector pay uh, will be resolved in the next few weeks. So important issues on the entry of the new Chancellor. Perhaps presumptuous to assume he may get the time to deal with that, given what we're hearing elsewhere in Whitehall today. All right, Faisal, thank you for now, Faisal Islam. Well, let's find out how voters are reacting to the events of the last 24 hours. The constituency of High Peak in Derbyshire swung to the Conservatives from Labour at the last election. Our correspondent Judith Moritz has been talking to people there. 200 miles from Westminster, Whaley Bridge feels far removed. But the Prime Minister's reputation matters here. There's been lots of support for him, but it's being severely tested. At the end of Johnson Street sits the builders' merchants, where they say they put a price on honesty. It'd be a lot cheaper than what we did yesterday, but I'll find yeah. out and I'll confirm the right, price okay. to you. And where views are changing. I felt sorry for him in a way, because he's had a lot of pressure, what with Covid, and then we're coming into the Ukraine war, which he's trying to sort that out. And then there's all the party gate, which I'm not sure about, but there's just too many lies coming out of his mouth. And after the two head ministers resigned yesterday, I thought, it is time now. If they haven't got confidence in Boris, then he does need to go. People here know how it feels when things are precarious. The PM visited them in 2019 when the town was evacuated because a nearby dam threatened to burst. There is lots of support here for Conservative ideology, but the local MP only holds this seat by the slimmest of majorities, just over 500 votes. And so come a general election, what's going on at Westminster could make a real difference here. Issues like the cost of living are an obvious priority, but personality politics matter too, according to 18-year-old Gemma. So you're studying politics. What do you make of the, the professionals, of how, how the government are handling things? They're not being great role models, in all fairness. Like, we need someone there to be in charge and have their expertise and show us, guide us the way. They're meant to be the people with the knowledge who are meant to guide us, but they're just not. 
Oh, it matters to me a hell of a lot. Outside, I found Colin, whose loyalty is wavering. I've been a Conservative all my life, since 1960-odd. And there's one thing I always believe in, and that is honesty. And if you're not honest, the public will not have you. The town's no longer under threat from the Reservoir Dam, but whether the government has a bright future here is another matter. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Whaley Bridge. Well, let's try to assess the reaction in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. Uh, we'll go, uh, we'll hear the very latest from our correspondent Alexander McKenzie, who's in Glasgow, Ender McClafferty, who is in Belfast. First, though, let's head to Cardiff and join our Wales correspondent, Hal Griffith. Hal. Yeah, Jane, lots of Welsh Conservatives not answering the call this morning, wanting to keep their powder dry. But one man who had no choice but to face questions was the Welsh Secretary, Simon Hart, answering questions in the Commons. He's been a Boris Johnson loyalist over the last uh, few weeks, out to bat on his behalf. The question put to him in the Commons, would he resign from the Cabinet too? His answer was, well, no. He says that the Welsh office is carrying on with business as normal. But that's not strictly true because his... Um, parliamentary Private Secretary uh, Virginia Crosby is one of those people who has already put in her resignation. And amongst a flurry of letters in the last 24 hours, some of her words the most stinging, talking about the uh, number of allegations of impropriety and illegality and reaching the conclusion that the British public no longer trusted the Prime Minister to tell the truth. The leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew R.T. Davis, put out a more neutral statement saying that it's disappointing that Boris Johnson now needs to deliver on his mandate. Uh, Boris Johnson's opponents here in Wales, not surprisingly, calling for him to go. Labour's first minister here, Mark Drakeford, tweeting earlier on uh, that the UK deserved a government it could trust, not one that just propped up the Prime Minister. Everyone here keeping their eyes on Westminster. What's happening up in Scotland? Let's ask uh, my colleague Alexandra McKenzie, who's in Glasgow. <laughs> We have just heard from the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Douglas Ross, and he has just called on the Prime Minister to resign. Douglas Ross has said the Prime Minister needs to realise he's lost the support of many colleagues and he has to stand down as Prime Minister. He also said it's not an easy thing for many of us to tell the Prime Minister, but the time is up and he needs to step aside. So that just in from the Scottish Conservative leader, Douglas Ross. The Scottish Secretary, Alistair Jack, he said last night he was supporting uh, Boris Johnson, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. She said on social media it feels like the end might be nigh for Mr Johnson. He says that's not a moment too soon. And in her words, she added that the whole rotten lot needs to go. And she said Scotland needs the permanent alternative of independence. She spoke to Boris Johnson about that a couple of days ago. He said, as he always does, the now is not the time. The SNP are saying that they would be ready for a general election if there was to be one. They would fight that on the single issue of independence. So that's the mood here in Scotland. Now with reaction from Northern Ireland, we're joined by my colleague Enda McClafferty, who's in Belfast. Well, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, of course, a big Johnson loyalist, has this morning pledged his support to the Prime Minister, but his personal private secretary, another MP, has resigned, like many others today. Now, we are, of course, locked in our own political crisis here in Northern Ireland. The DUP has walked away from power sharing and protest at the Northern Ireland Protocol. And if there is this question mark over Boris Johnson's future, that does present a big challenge here because of the fact that the EU might well now consider that Boris Johnson's days are numbered and therefore will be less willing to strike a deal over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Then we have legislation, of course, moving through Westminster right now, seeking to strip away parts of that protocol, and that may now run into difficulties in the autumn, particularly if there is a leadership change in number 10. So you can see the problems stacking up, and all those problems very much linked to the return of power sharing here in Northern Ireland. Of course, Boris Johnson doesn't have any great political allies here, and the majority of the Stormont parties today basically said that they would be glad to see the back of Boris Johnson. And the indications are, given what's happened over the past 24 hours, we are no closer here to the reset button being pressed at Stormont. Jane. All right, Enda, thank you. Enda, Alexandra and Howell. And just a pointer that you can keep up to date, uh, as best anyone can, uh, on all of this on the BBC News website and app, bbc.co.uk slash news.
Now we will take a look at the other main stories here this lunchtime. And law enforcement authorities from across Europe say they've dismantled what's believed to be the biggest international migrant smuggling operation. Which has, been, uh, which has seen up to 10,000 people sent across the English Channel over the last 18 months. With all the details, here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Samford. Yeah. Police, you're under arrest. Come over here. In coordinated raids yesterday right across Europe... I'm arresting you on suspicion of immigration offences under Section 25 of the Immigration Act. ...suspected people smugglers were being rounded up. Here in south-east London, it was a 26-year-old man. There was an arrest in East London too. Both are being held on suspicion of conspiring to facilitate illegal immigration. It's all part of a Europe-wide operation targeting what's believed to be one of the most significant organised crime groups involved in smuggling people across the Channel using small boats. Of the 39 arrests made across Europe, the largest number, 18, was in Germany. The area around the city of Osnabrück is thought to have been the smugglers' logistical hub. Here they stored the boats, engines and life jackets, which were then moved on to France when needed. German police found 150 boats, enough to smuggle 7,500 people, if crammed in 50 to a boat, as often happens. It's been a long time in the, in the coming, and it is the biggest group that we've seen in all of our intelligence collection right across. It's the biggest one we've seen. We believe that they've been responsible for bringing up to 10,000 migrants across the channel in the 12 to 18 months that we've been uh, targeting them. The gang are thought to have brought the boats from Turkey in large numbers and then discreetly sent them to France in ones, twos and threes. They were charging around £3,000 for a crossing, supplying barely seaworthy boats and underpowered engines. They would launch up to 15 boats simultaneously. It's hoped today's operation will put a significant dent in the number of people crossing the channel. Daniel Sandford, BBC News. In the US, the man accused of opening fire on a 4th of July parade near Chicago has been charged with seven counts of murder. Prosecutors said Robert Cremo would face dozens more charges as the police continue to investigate the mass shooting. Normia Iqbal sent this report from Illinois. Families had been celebrating the day their nation found independence when gunshots rang out. A traditional event in this country has been destroyed by what is becoming another American tradition, a mass shooting. A 21-year-old has been charged with bringing terror to this town. Robert Cremo has been accused of carrying out what authorities say was a well-orchestrated and carefully planned crime. Today, the Lake County State's Attorney's Office has charged Robert Cremo III with seven counts of first-degree murder <laughs> for the killing spree that he has unleashed against our community. These are just the first of many charges that will be filed against Mr. Cremo. More details have come out about the victims. Nicholas Toledo's family had taken him out for celebrations. Jackie Sundheim was described as a beloved member of the local synagogue where she worked. Investigations by police and the FBI have shown that Robert Cremo dressed up as a woman as he fled the scene of the crime. This happened just down the road behind me. Police say the gunman climbed the rooftop with his gun overlooking the parade and shot 70 rounds. He then disappeared. It was hours later when the police caught him on the motorway in a car. Recently, major gun legislation was passed in the US to tackle gun violence, although it wouldn't have stopped him as he had legally purchased his rifle. Clash of two American traditions, a wonderful tradition of families, Fourth of July, a horrible tradition of mass shootings. Are mass shootings now a tradition in America? I don't want it to be, but it's becoming one. If Cremo is convicted, authorities here say they will make sure he is jailed for life without parole. Nomi Rickbell, BBC News, Highland Park, Chicago. 
Well, we are going to turn now to sport because it is a busy and exciting day. The Women's European Football Championship kicks off this evening. England is hosting and the Lionesses are among the favourites. They take on Austria in front of 70,000 fans at Old Trafford tonight. Northern Ireland will be making their debut in the tournament, which has been delayed because of the pandemic. Let's go to our sports correspondent, Natalie Perks, who is a pitch side at Old Trafford. Natalie. Well, Jane, this is certainly the quietest it's going to be at Old Trafford because, as you've said, it is a sellout tonight. And playing at the Theatre of Dreams for these women is a far cry from the first official Euros uh, for the women in 1984. They played on waterlogged pitches, just four teams. England made the final and, in familiar fashion, they lost on penalties. Fast forward to modern day and England are very much hoping uh, this could change the women's game here forever. But to win hearts, they must first win. Months of talking has led us here. Old Trafford is a sellout tonight, as are all of England's games. And as the players took in the enormity of their situation as hosts, they're relishing the renewed focus on the women's game. We know what to expect um, and we're ready for it. But yeah, I think everybody's got their own things in place now to be able to deal with it. And, you know, pressure's a privilege. So um, it's something that we're embracing. England are one of the favourites for this tournament, but the fact remains Bobby Moore is the last captain to have lifted a major trophy for England. The men made it all the way to the final here last summer. Can the Lionesses go one better and win it? It's something they've never managed before. Chance for six. Six scored by Germany. When they last made the final in 2009, they were hammered by Germany. Since then, they've fallen at the semi-finals hurdle at the last three major tournaments. Chelsea's Frank Kirby had a front row seat for all three and doesn't fancy a repeat. It takes a long time to get over it when you unfortunately don't get there. But yeah, I think you just got to use it as motivation. It's definitely my motivation. I don't want to feel the way I did, you know, losing them semi-finals. So hopefully we can do one better and get to the final this time. Dutch manager Serena Wiegman took the reins of the Lionesses last September to much acclaim and she's backing up the hype. 14 matches, no defeats, 12 wins. 30 yards across the deck, Brunnen's cross the far stick, Midima's there, Jones it is! She coached the reigning champions Netherlands to glory in 2017, but this, this is different. Everything is more bigger, more expectations, higher expectations, the level of the game is higher, so actually it's hard to compare. But I think the players are more experienced and have had more moments already in this higher environment. Attendance is where the women's game needs improvement, but a record half a million tickets have been sold. The further England go, the more the game could grow. Great chance for England. Kirby Natalie Perks, BBC News. And let's head to Wimbledon as well, because there are some exciting quarter-final matches this afternoon. Laura Scott is at the All England Club. Laura. Well, the sun might not be shining here at Wimbledon, but it is still basking in the British success from last night when Cameron Norrie came through what he described as a crazy match on a crazy day to set up a semi-final on Friday with none other than Novak Djokovic. After some emotional celebrations, Norrie did admit he will need to raise his level and raise his focus if he is to beat Djokovic, but said he would take it to the top seed. Today, we've got eight more players trying to book their spots in the semi-finals. We've got the former champion Simona Halep, who's yet to drop a set in the championship so far, playing the young American Amanda Anasimova first on centre court. Then another American, the informed Taylor Fritz, plays the two-time champion Rafael Nadal, who's already won the first two Grand Slams of the year. And then on number one court behind me, it's a big day for Australian tennis because Alia Tomljanovic is in action now and then Nick Kyrgios. We'll wait to see if the court summons he faced yesterday to face allegations of a common assault has had any impact on him. He was silent on the matter yesterday. But away from the singles, there are two Brits in doubles action today. On court two at the moment is Joe Salisbury in the quarterfinals of the men's doubles. He's playing with the American Rajiv Ram. They are the top seeds and are up two sets to one. And then later, Jane, we could have the first Brit through to the final as Neil Skupski plays in the semi-finals of the mixed doubles.
Laura, thank you. Laura Scott at Wimbledon now, as promised. We will just get some final thoughts about the story that dominates here at Westminster. Of course, let's rejoin our political correspondent, Nick Erdley, and the Prime Minister. More questions to answer this afternoon. It's the Liaison Committee, of course. Yeah, Jane, it's a busy afternoon for Boris Johnson. He's up before that committee at 3 o'clock. But there's a lot else going on at the same time. He'll be trying to shore up some support among pretty glum-looking Tory MPs this afternoon. But at the same time, there are powerful backbenchers discussing changing the rules to allow another confidence vote in the Prime Minister, potentially within days. Now, the PM spokesman has said within the last hour that Boris Johnson would fight that vote. But I have to say, chatting to Tory MPs around here, including some of the Prime Minister's allies, there aren't many who say confidently that he'd definitely win it. Nick, thank you. Nick Erdley, for now. Let us take a look right now at the weather prospects wherever you are in the country. Here's Thomas Schaffernacker. Jane, thanks. Well, it's quiet on the weather front uh, at the moment. Skies like this uh, for many of us, but the outlook is looking very different. It's going to turn very warm and settled over the next few days across many parts of the UK, but not today. Today, it's quite fresh actually across the north, a breeze off the Atlantic and a little bit of rain too, which is actually riding around this area of high pressure, which is to the south of us. So this is where the settled sunny weather is at the moment. This is an Azores high. And the thinking is that with the jet stream to the north of us next week, this very large area of settled weather will be building across the UK and that's going to allow the temperatures to rise. So the forecast then for this afternoon, so cool, breezy and fairly cloudy across the northern half of the UK but you know not bad 18 in Belfast very warm uh, in the south of the country mid 20s I think at least and then through the course of tonight we'll see a band of a uh, little bit of cloud and rain moving from north to south but still quite warm in the morning around 16 in London a little bit fresher there in Belfast and Glasgow around about 12 to 14. Now tomorrow we'll start off a little on the cloudy side first thing but then come the afternoon I think the sun's going to break through the clouds and it should be quite a beautiful day along the North Sea coast the south coast as well and again another warm one in the south and the southeast low to mid 20s and not a bad day there in Glasgow and Edinburgh and Newcastle probably nudging up to around 20 or so that was Thursday this is Friday's weather forecast and very similar I think just the chance of a little bit of rain here in western parts of Scotland but on the whole it's a bright if not sunny day the sunniest of the weather always towards the east and the south and already quite hot in London in the high 20s and that is a hint of things to come as we head into the weekend and beyond. So the weekend we're forecasting at the moment a lot of very warm and sunny weather with this area of high pressure that I showed you earlier on building in or nosing in over the top of the UK. To the northwest always a bit more cloud, we're closer to weather systems here but the vast majority of the country on Saturday enjoying that warm sunny day and as I said turning quite hot across the south of the country and those temperatures are only going to rise, we're pretty confident of that. In fact as we head into next week uh, we could be entering uh, quite a prolonged spell of uh, heat, uh, a heat wave, which could end up being uh, quite oppressive for some of us. Thomas, oh, oppressive. Thomas, thank you very much. Thomas Schaffernacker with all your latest weather. Just a reminder now of the main headline at this lunchtime. The Prime Minister remains defiant. He says he is getting on with his job despite a steady stream of ministerial resignations. And that is all from the News at One team. So it's goodbye from me here in Downing Street. On BBC One, we'll join our news teams now, wherever you are. Have a good afternoon.